here today with the latest information about research in nutrition and psoriasis is dermatologist Dr. Benjamin Kaffenberger. He's the Associate Professor of Dermatology, Director of the Medical Student Research Program at the College of Medicine, and Vice Chair of Research in the Department of Dermatology at Ohio State University and Wexner Medical Center. Dr. Kaffenberger specializes in hospital dermatology and immune-mediated skin diseases. You may have heard of Dr. Kaffenberger if you listen to Soundbites, episode number 62, which we explore his research around oral health symptoms and diet in the development of and severity of psoriasis. Dr. Kaffenberger is continuing to explore the relationship of diet and psoriasis. Dr. Kaffenberger is here today to provide the latest information he's learned about the role of nutrition. So let's all welcome Dr. Kaffenberger. Good morning, everyone. Uh, or, well, I'm sorry. Good afternoon, I guess, um, if you're on the East Coast. And, and uh, good morning to those who are in Oregon and with the MPF. So thank you so much for having me. It's a, it's a huge honor, and I am I'm, uh, feel great and, and to have this opportunity. I feel very blessed to have this opportunity to speak before you today, and, and specifically to be funded um, by the National Psoriasis Foundation as well, too look into this association in the first place, which is um, a huge opportunity and, and I think something that's an unmet need because this came around largely by patients, um, grassroots patients asking these kind of questions and um, and that's been a, a major motivating factor throughout this. So uh, hopefully that'll come out in my talk here. All right. So So today I'm going to talk about skin, nutrition, and oral health. I do have a couple of disclosures. Um, so in terms of funding, uh, I am funded mostly as an investigator for, for multiple uh, clinical trial organizations. Um, as far as that goes, though, we will not be discussing any actual pharmaceutical therapies in psoriasis today. So I, I think that for the most part, these are not relevant, um, with the exception of the National Psoriasis Foundation um, and their funding into our intermittent fasting setting. So major thank you to the National Psoriasis Foundation for your uh, support. I have two major objectives I'm hoping that you'll get out of the, the discussion today. And, and the first one is to recognize that there are known associations of nutrients and micronutrient disorders with skin disease in particular. Uh, and then the second is that I want to be able to discuss, hopefully come away just with a uh, ability to discuss what's happening, the existing research on uh, oral health, dieting, and association with, with both the development and the severity of psoriasis as well too. So some uh, non kind of pharmacologic methods to, to hopefully control disease and improve disease, especially. Where did this all come from? Well, it, it really came from, from two parts. And I think the first um, uh, one aspect that, that came at this was my specialization in, in hospital dermatology, where when I first started my career, I was seeing patients in the hospital every day um, and, and running our consult service every day. And I've stepped back a little bit from that over the time. But it wasn't uncommon for us to see patients such as this one, where the emergency department is saying, you know, this is just a patient that's just been let go forever. And, and, you know, what has happened? We have no idea what's happening with this patient, whether this is psoriasis, whether this is a more severe disease. Um, we don't know, but this patient is not obviously not in a healthy place, uh, is not someone who should be at, at home until that this patient is in a much, much, much healthier place. And when we look at patients um, like this patient and, and other patients, um, this this was nutritional disease. Um, this was a patient that had a really severe nutritional disease. And, and the kicker here is that, that a skin biopsy in, in a patient like this would show psoriasis, actually. Um, and so there are some some high overs from that standpoint. And the uh, the other major kind of impetus for for this work and this research that I've done is the patients themselves, and and it's patients coming in in particular and saying. Um, I'm not feeling great about going on such and such medication. I know you have a plan to, to be more aggressive about my psoriasis, um, but are there other options? Or I've done my own research and I'm interested in doing a gluten-free diet. Um, what What is the data? What do you recommend that? And so that's been a major uh, impetus. Uh, the two of these have been the major impetus. Some, some of the kind of early work that we did in this area to kind of build on the nutrition nutritional aspect is, um, is for example, this study, which we published in the Journal of the American Academy of Dermatology. Um, but what this, this basically shows, the gray lines are the overall number of, of 
patients that we were seeing in our hospital setting for dermatologic diseases or who were in our hospital period, whether or not dermatology saw them or not. The blue line is the number of patients that you know my service was seeing in the hospital. So that was about somewhere between 1,000 and 1,200 of the patients of uh, 3,700 3, to 4,000 patients per year um, who had some sort of skin disease that was documented. And the point that, that I wanted to make here is, is just that if you don't look for nutritional diseases or if you don't consider oral health, hygiene, um, malnutrition, nutritional disorders, you're not going to diagnose them. And so, you know, I think 2012, 2013, this was towards the end of my residency. And 2014 is when I actually took over um, the service. And you can see that our number of, of diagnoses that we're making, and I'll fully admit that I think we're still uh, underestimating the total number of patients that, that are affected by these nutrient disorders, but it has nearly doubled when our overall number of patients that we're seeing is still very similar across. So uh, the point here is just that if you're not looking for them or not considering them, you're not going to find them. Um, and they're not without impact either. So again, patients with especially zinc-associated dermatoses often do have a, a biopsy that can show psoriasis-like thickening of the skin. Um, and these are not insignificant. Diagnosing these are important. This is in our hospital setting and our hospital patients. But the patients that, that had these disorders, nutrient disorders, um, not only did they stay in the hospital much longer because they, they looked sicker, they weren't improving, um, but also patients were more likely to die when they were diagnosed with these disorders as well, too. So it is actually a critical, it's not, not just something that's, um, uh, you know, just an appearance thingy. This is uh, one of our colleagues work at a, at a different institution, but it's showing basically the same thing and it's published around the same time. Um, and what this is showing is that patients with, with skin diseases with nutritional disorders, whether that's zinc, whether that's a macronutrient, like a protein, like albumin is what's being measured here. Um, the patient's survival is different depending on whether these are identified or not. So it is a critical thing to identify when you're suspicious and, and I can go over some things that make us suspicious. These are the, the list of, of micronutrient uh, deficiencies that have very well-established uh, dermatoses. And, and these are the features, these are some of the features that you, we consider when we're um, determining whether this is um, present or not. So um, macronutrients, these, these are proteins. These are proteins, cholesterols, li lipids. This is um, carbohydrates. Um, and, and most often this is measured by, by, by protein level. Um, different kind of findings that you see, lanugo hairs, these, these are these really light, fine hairs that, that are actually uh, widespread. Swelling of the body is very characteristic with a, a wasted appearance, these flaky paint, but that, that can be thickening of the skin as well, too. That can be suspicious, suspicious for other diseases that, that look in the psoriasis-like category. Um, and then some micronutrient, um, this is our, our vitamin deficiencies, vitamins and, and um, minerals as well, too. And so you can see specific hair changes that a, a dermatologist can identify under, underneath the microscope. Seborrheic dermatitis, which, which is very uh, challenging to differentiate from psoriasis in specific situations. Um, and then some nail changes and some mouth changes as well, too. And I, I can go through some of these images just to give you an idea. And we can see them in different different areas of the body too. So this is a different way to kind of look at it. Um, but scalp, so seeing someone that has like a psoriasis-like pattern just on the scalp that's really extreme and not responding to treatments, um, that can be associated with some of our B vitamin deficiencies, for example. Um, patients that have a, a inverse pattern uh, of psoriasis that look like just inverse pattern, um, but it's more eroded typically too. That can be almost a, a zinc uh, type pattern as well too. So the, and so this is kind of what I was saying earlier about, about these locations. The seborrheic dermatitis is a B vitamin association that, that can be present. Most cases aren't, but but it can be something to consider. Um, and then as we had discussed, this, this um, the same thing that has like inverse pattern when it's in the folds of the skin that can actually be a zinc deficiency. Um, these are some appearances of, of patients that uh, we've had in the hospital. Um, and, and again, kind of push this whole process along and develop, made me develop that interest in, in nutrition um, and the relationship with the skin in the first place. This is a patient that has this, this flaky paint kind of, of skin. Um, it's thickening of the skin that, that you see and, and on a biopsy it would be thickening of the skin similar to psoriasis. Um, this is a, a patient that has a protein deficiency. This is a patient that has a 
uh, B vitamin deficiency. And this, you can see that it has a predominance of the sun exposed areas in, in particular um, of his body. Um, and so this is actually a specific B vitamin uh, deficiency that this patient had. Um, here's a patient that has numerous of these open um, what we call comedones or, or blackheads just diffusely. This is a patient that has a vitamin A deficiency. This is a patient that has a multinutrient deficiency, scaly dermatitis, multi-nutrients uh, uh, were, de were detected. Uh, same thing, this is the same patient in her legs, and we see this extensive bruising as well too. So while you could actually consider for her back, you know, could this be a very early psoriasis, you put more together with it and the fact that she's got this extensive bruising in her legs and in uh, this bruising at least, this is vitamin C deficiency, that's, that's what we call scurvy. Um, and so this is a different patient, but but same kind of thing. This is as classic as it gets for, for you know, I think most people have heard of scurvy, so I'll say it like that, but that's vitamin C deficiency. Um, you know, it wasn't just a disease of, of sailors in 1800s. This, this disease very much still exists. And the CDC says it's maybe six to 7% of the population is deficient in vitamin C. Most of them are not getting as severe as what this patient has in the previous patient where they, they have bleeding into their joints. Um, but it's not an inconsequential disease at all. Um, here's here's another patient in the hospital setting. Just another example, but but same thing. It's that that bleeding, that that bruising that the patient has in their joints. You see that on top of some other other features, and that just makes you much more suspicious that that patient does have a a, a nutrient disorder. And uh, this is another patient, a, a different patient, um, who has this overgrowth of their their uh, gingiva. Uh, and this is another manifestation of, of vitamin C deficiencies as well, too. This is a patient, if we biopsy this, we'd see some thickening of the skin. Uh, there, and there can be some other clues to um, nutrient disorders. But uh, they, uh, our, our data shows that they look often um, diagnosed as a psoriasis-like disorder on, when, we, when we biopsy these patients. And the, these more specific features that you look for or that we're taught to look for um, are not always seen. Um, same same kind of thing, predominant folds. This is a, a zinc deficiency patient, um, and these are also also of the same patient. So, so just a couple more kind of points before I get into a little bit more specific data about about diets. But when we look at our, our patient data here, and we've now run it across, um, you know, I showed some early data, but we've been much more aggressive about testing patients. And we're looking at um, hundreds of patients that have had skin disorders in our hospital setting and also had uh, been tested for micronutrients um, during their hospitalization. Um, there, there's a couple really kind of key things. And so we have the different micronutrients up here labeled out. But a couple really kind of key things to, to point out is that patients that um, may have malnutrition are not what you necessarily expect. And so in our hospital setting, when we look at patients, it's not, we, we, and we do have patients, I, I, you can see from the, the body type of some of the patients, we have some very, very thin patients that, that you know maybe stereotypically you think of have a nutrient deficiency. But our average BMI of our patients that have these disorders, it's not underweight. It's not normal weight even. Um, the average BMI for our patients with these micronutrient disorders is actually uh, overweight and even obese in certain situations and certain diseases or certain types as well too. So you can't just rely on, oh, this person's body weight suggests that maybe they have malnourished. Um, it, it's a different uh, it's a different issue. Someone can be getting plenty of carbohydrates, but not getting the additional nutrients that they need in addition to that. Other things is that there's just a couple specific diseases that, that do also really need to kind of increase our Suspicion, chronic liver disease um, is one that should really increase our, our suspicion. Patients that have had bariatric surgery and malabsorption, um, the numbers aren't huge that we have with this, uh, but at the same time, the overall numbers that are in the hospital uh, are very low. So, so patients that have had bariatric surgery, even if they're not you know, thin necessarily, or they're not underweight, still need to consider these, these micronutrients um, disorders. Psychiatric disorders and cancer. Uh, um, cancer patients in particular, it has to be also considered. The metabolism of the body increases significantly and they have a higher micronutrient um, requirement. Um, and so that, that increases their uh, demand. And if you test the patients, 
oftentimes we'll find that there is a micronutrient disorder in, in maybe two, um, a quarter, quarter of our data. I'm going to skip through this just in the interest of time here, um, but there are tests for these different micronutrient disorders, and they're usually typically without insurance, somewhere between fifty and eighty dollars for most most of the tests, um, plasma tests. There are are concerns with some of them. Some of them are not a good test of the full body um, reserves that, that are present, but it, it's at least a place to start. And and I think just even considering it is really the place to start. And that's what what drove a lot of our our further research. So that's that's my background, and that's kind of what got us into this next step. And so um, the next objective that I'm hopeful hopeful that you will get out of this is, is to be able to discuss um, research that that's ongoing and, and that's that's been already done that is looking at oral health, diets, nutrition, um, specifically in patients that have chronic psoriasis as well too. This is a little infographic looking at um, you know what kind of role do these these areas play in, and, and it's much more complicated, of course, than this, but um, clearly there's a huge genetic susceptibility component to psoriasis that, that's leading to systemic inflammation. Um, there is this aspect of the, the Western diet, um, a pro-inflammatory diet, um, as a form of a trigger that's also leading and also driving some forms of, 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 of systemic inflammation. And that may be able to be reduced by things like a Mediterranean diet, changing the diet. There's also signaling molecules um, specifically from the fat cells, where things like weight loss can actually make a difference in the overall systemic inflammation levels. And then this chronic systemic inflammation, we know that has multiple downstream consequences, but in particular to psoriasis, you know, we see this kind of pathway where it gets down to activation of the T cells, and then the T cells activating the actual skin cells to over proliferate. And, and then that's what we're seeing as the disease psoriasis. The uh, molecules in between, these are, these are the chemical si signaling molecules that actually drive that differentiation, drive and push those T cells in the direction um, and the skin cells to over overproduce. So I want to first start with kind of the association of oral health and skin disease. So not even going into nutrition quite yet, but, you know, we took an interest in, in this area first. And, and, you know, we know that there's numerous comorbidities among patients with psoriasis that may be part of the disease, driving the disease, or just, just um, maybe even there by happenstance. But one of them is, is different um, oral health outcomes that are present. So we did a systematic review. This is back um, a few years ago, looking at, at uh, anything that had to do with, with dental, oral, tonsil health, um, and any sort of article that's published in association with psoriasis. And what we'll see, I don't have a good infographic to give you, but there's basically three different things that, that are widely published. And, and the first one is, is periodontal disease, periodontitis, gingivitis, the active inflammation. So around the gums that patients will develop. And it can be multifactorial. Many things will contribute to it. Smoking contributes to it without a doubt. Alcohol contributes to it. Poor diet contributes to it. Uh, poor hygiene contributes to it. All of those things uh, con contribute to the development of this. But so of the three kind of themes, one is, is the development of periodontal disease being associated with psoriasis. So patients with this periodontal disease, inflammation of the gums, um, is strongly associated with psoriasis. The second main theme is, is the microbiome, so the different bacteria that are present in the mouth. And, and the bacteria are different in patients with uh, psoriasis and not, not everyone, but uh, at least they're more likely. And in, in particular, it's the streptococcal bacteria uh, that's present or streptococcal genus that, that's present more often in patients that have that have psoriasis. And that makes sense because, you know, strep throats associations with especially children um, and getting that gut hate form of psoriasis, that makes sense. But it but it may be more than just just that. And so it's definitely worth further, further research and further investigation. And then the third one, which I think is out there pretty well, and the data is very good, and it's probably partly related to this as well, as which, which is the association of tonsillectomies um, and improvement, at least of gut hate psoriasis. But even in some patients with chronic plaque psoriasis, there can be some improvement as well, too, especially guttate psoriasis, but, but even chronic plaque psoriasis as well, too. So um, those are the three, three major themes that are out there. 
but I think that there's even more than this. And I think that there, there ought to be even more research in this area because I think it is, a, it is a critical one. I also think that there's challenges here because when we look at large data sets, there's a disconnect between um, dental records and and medical records for patients. And, and it's a, a shame because we know that there's a strong association with psoriasis and, and oral health. Uh, a challenge is though, is, is that when we look at how the data is uh, inputted, we lose a lot of the dental data, at least in the United States databases, because um, it's a different insurance that, that they're going through in the first place. Um, and so we're not collecting at the same time the diagnoses, whether periodontal diagnoses were made in the first place. And I don't know many dermatologists or, or uh, primary care doctors that are making this diagnosis of periodontal disease either, or even ENT. So next after that, we wanted to look at, uh, this is just a survey of, of patients that we had in our clinic. And so we looked at our, our psoriasis patients and we had a control group of all other diagnoses that we were seeing in the, in the, um, the clinics. And we wanted to kind of work along this oral health aspect. And uh, we, we handed out a survey. Uh, it was a World Health Organization validated survey to them and had, had all patients that, that were interested um, fill out the survey. And what we wanted to look at is just um, the state of their oral health, according to this World Health Organization um, uh, um, survey that we were doing. Um, the most important col column is, is this one here. Um, and so this is looking at characteristics of our patients that have psoriasis versus our patients that don't have psoriasis. So, so what are the, some of the main differences that we're seeing in terms of, um, and this is just an abbreviated table, but we have to get kind of the, the things that don't even, we would know, or that we know are associated with psoriasis. So family history of psoriasis, of course, is strongly associated with our group that has, has psoriasis. But similarly, like just what we said, personal history of strep throat. It wasn't just patients with guttate psoriasis. Um, this group was 90% chronic black psoriasis. Um, but at the same time, the psoriasis patients were two times as likely as, as patients that were control patients, so who did not have psoriasis, to have a history of strep throat infections in the first place. And that's adjusting for other uh, confounding variables, other variables that are important. Personal history of, of rheumatoid arthritis, um, that was also something that, that was seen here, but but same thing, we think that might have been um, some misdiagnosis with psoriatic arthritis, most likely. Um, but so so the key kind of thing here is, is that even in this chronic black psoriasis group, it's not just gut taste psoriasis. We need to look harder in, in most patients with psoriasis um, as far as the strep, strep association. And then so this is the same, this is a uh, the same survey that we are handing out to patients, but also same kind of odds ratio. So, so patients with psoriasis compared to our other groups were twice as likely, two times as likely to have, have had some sort of oral pain discomfort over the past 12 months. So they were twice as likely to respond um, affirmatively to that question as our control patients. And we think that is that is impactful. I mean, so I, I don't diagnose my patients with periodontitis. I'm not not a, um, an expert enough to do that. But we do think that there's some impact here that, that our psoriasis patients are uh, twice as likely as our other, other skin disease patients um, to report this oral pain and discomfort. And the follow-up study that I'd like to do of this is also looking at access to care, especially uh, dental, dental access to care um, among our patients and whether there's a difference. Um, the second aspect that, that we are also trying to do is, is looking in between our patients that have psoriasis and looking at if there's certain associations that the survey that we handed out with them, um, you know, are there specific associations that we're seeing that impact the severity of their psoriasis? And we're measuring the severity of their psoriasis by their overall body surface, how much of the body surface and how the severe it is. And we made, made it into it. Well, we didn't make it into it. We used a validated uh, a score um, based on those two factors. And so what you, you'll you notice here in bold here, and this is the important column here, the bold, bold are the ones that, that are most impactful, um, the ones that we're, we believe are reliable based on the patient numbers that we have. But body mass index, yeah, so, so heavier patients were a little bit more likely to have more severe forms of psoriasis. Patients rated their own gum health. Patients that... Um, self-rated their own gum health as poor or very poor, 
were significantly, significantly, significantly more likely to have severe psoriasis, severe forms of psoriasis. Patients that have had experienced speech difficulty over the past 12 months, again, and, and, and the, um, so there's a difference, you know, of it's associated, it's not association. And then there's a, a, a level of, you know, is it a small association, uh, extensive? Um, and these are big uh, differences that we are seeing between the group that says no and the group that says yes. Um, patients that are seeing speech difficulty, their psoriasis is much more severe than the others. And then, um, you know, so then we went down and you, know, you can see this is a negative number, but patients that had, compared to patients that seldom ate fresh fruit, uh, the ones that ate every day or several times per day, you can see it's a negative number. Um, there's a significant negative association to the severity. So those patients were more likely, far more likely to have more mild psoriasis. So um, we think this all feeds into to, um, the type of bacteria that are present, the health of the gingiva that are present, the health around the teeth um, and tonsils as well too, this whole uh, microenvironment in the mouth in, in the first place and, and think that that's impacting probably more patients than what we give credit for their psoriasis. We extended this a little bit further and we did a different survey looking at, at different patient diseases. And this was directly to some um, Facebook group. So it wasn't, we didn't actually validate how severe these patients were, but this was actually a question looking at, you know, are dermatologists, are we doing enough to counsel our patients in the first place, whether that's, you know, and this is looking at several different diseases, but in particular, something like psoriasis, um, major conditions that impact the health, the oral health. Smoking is one of the most deleterious ones. Um, you know, our, our dermatologists, if we just look at a, a random sample of patients that are on a Facebook affinity group for psoriasis and these other diseases, our, our dermatologists, uh, we asked our, our dermatologists counseling, have you been counseled about a, an association with your skin disease? Um, and, and these are different between different diseases because, you know, there's different associations between these different diseases, but we're seeing about 53% of patients with psoriasis were being counseled as far as alcohol and smoking. Now, vaping, you know, we were just trying to get some information on, on vaping and marijuana. We don't actually know that there's any sort of association. We were just looking looking at that uh, more relationship with some of these other skin diseases too, but it's happening. Some, some dermatologists are, but um, we think that that needs to be higher. We think more more dermatologists do need to talk to patients about oral health and what they can do, whether that's seeing a dentist, whether that's that's uh, avoiding smoking, especially. And that kind of brings us to to the dietary aspect here, and in our current research, this this is a systematic review that we did, and we're looking at intermittent fasting, which is a relatively popular form of calorie restriction. Um, or becoming a relatively popular form. And, and the idea here is, and it, there's different methods of doing this, but two to three days a week, more, you could make it more, or you could make it less. You choose a window where you're not going to consume any calories during that time frame. So 16, 16 hours twice a week is a very common method of doing it, but it could be multiple. Um, something that's out there in the literature a lot is actually during the, the Islamic holiday of Ramadan, when uh, Muslims, observant Muslims do not, are fasting between um, uh, sun up and sundown, uh, which depending on the season could be lo even longer than 12 hours. Um, there are several studies out there actually looking at patients and, and how their psoriasis did. So we found a series of studies. Um, they do have limitations. Um, and, and, you know, so this is our study here. This is our protocol. Doc, Dr. Uh, Gray's is with my fellow last year. Um, and there's another one actually that's being done very similar to ours uh, in Belgium as well, too. And we've actually reached out to them to, to see if there's any interesting collaboration. We haven't really heard back, but um, there's, there is a similar one, both of which were started in 2022. Um, but there's about five different studies that have been previously done. How good are they? They're, they're okay. I mean, none of them are randomized. So the quality, quality of data is, is, is it's okay. But there's definitely some evidence using these that um, this form of calorie restriction, and, and there's different methods of doing this. So you can see here like 14 hours a day, 17 hours a day, make a difference, not only in body weight, but also patient psoriasis. So outcome measures like the PASI improving as well too. This is uh, beyond just intermittent fasting. 
uh, I think this is a paper that Dr. Bhutani was actually involved in, um, beyond just intermittent fasting, any method of calorie restriction. And, and um, again, same kind of issues. The study quality is not always great because a lot of times they'll be doing diet plus active therapeutic like cyclosporin, uh, TNF inhibitor. Um, and so there's, there's more confounding in these. But the overall takeaway is that patients that, that went on and were successful with a low calorie diet and able to adhere to it did tend to have better psoriasis, uh, psoriasis outcomes in addition to, to uh, other beneficial outcomes, namely weight loss. This is uh, more specifically to just Mediterranean diet. So, so taking this kind of different fat, so, so far less animal fats, butters, uh, meat in the diet, and, and having a higher proportion of fish, olive oil um, in the diet. Two of them are, are uh, studies um, where they actually enrolled patients. One is just a survey. But the patients that had more severe psoriasis overall takeaway is that patients with more severe psoriasis were less likely to follow or less likely to adhere to this type of diet. Uh, and patients that did adhere more to a, a Mediterranean diet and a higher, um, a higher rigidity of that Mediterranean diet had improved psoriasis outcomes compared to the patients that did not. Gluten-free is another type of dieting that patients will ask a lot about. Um, and the data is not quite as strong here, but patients, there are several studies that show patients that have antibodies. So, so the blood tests showing that their, their um, uh, B cells have developed recognition to, to gluten to confirm it those patients in particular may do better. Their psoriasis may also do better with a gluten-free diet. Patients that don't have the antibodies, maybe, maybe not. Um, and the last kind of uh, other kind of diet that I think is, is relatively popular that there's some, some evidence here for is, is the ketogenic diet. So um, this is patients that are avoiding carbohydrates in particular, most forms of the carbohydrates um, and having a much higher proportion of fats and proteins in their diet to reduce the, the carbohydrate load. Both of these studies were, were done by the same investigator um, in a very short study as well too. It definitely has some limitations to the study, but the study did show that, that there were significant improvements in psoriasis severity associated with even doing the keto diet for four weeks in addition to having weight loss for the patients as well too. You may be interested in supplements as well too. Um, a kind of a quick summary of this since we're, we're running a little bit low on time. Fish oil supplements may be a, some modest at best effects. Some studies, other controlled studies have shown no effects. So it's, it's a little bit uh, to be determined. Oral vitamin D, certainly if you're vitamin D deficient, yes, supplement it. Now, if you're not vitamin D deficient, it typically looks like PASI scores are not changing with it. And then selenium, smaller studies, uh, lower quality. And there's very mixed effects across low quality uh, studies. So it's very uncertain there as well, too. So that brings us to kind of um, data that's fresh off the press. We're, we're finishing up the study. We've got still a few more patients on, on it. But this is the actual study that the National Psoriasis Foundation um, funded us to do. And we've got enrolled 42 patients throughout the <clears throat> Ohio region where we randomized patients to either control um, where we asked them not to change their diet and versus patients that were uh, intermittent fasting, asking them to do 16 hours a day, at least twice a week. And we logged everything as well too for them as well because we wanted to get what their adherence was. Now, a key thing with this is, is that unlike some of these other studies, we did not enroll patients with severe disease, moderate to severe disease, because um, we felt like there's less of, with where this was, with, with funding and everything like that, if, if patients were going on to... to biologics or, or advanced uh, pharmaceutical treatments at the same time, it would really impact our results and we'd have to throw a bunch of patients off um, the study. So instead, we actually thought there was a bigger place for patients that were uh, often on these treatments, but maybe not completely controlled. So, it, but it, so it's, it's mild, patients with mild psoriasis in the first place. So it's a little bit of a different category than what our other uh, studies we've looked at um, have shown. And so in addition to that, since it is milder patients, the, we wouldn't be surprised if the, the overall effect size is lower than some of these other studies that have shown in intermittent fasting. So 
but overall between our intermittent fasting group and our control group, <clears throat> male to female proportions, very similar. Um, most of the patients were white that enrolled in this. So we, it, you know, this is a preliminary study. We are looking to increase our diversity on, a, on an additional study later to make sure that this does is more applicable to um, um, people throughout the America and throughout the world. Proportion of patients with psoriatic arthritis, some around 27 and 30% in each group. Um, and about 45, somewhere between 45 and 60% of our patients were on a, a biologic uh, therapy uh, at the time of enrollment. These are the overall kind of numbers of our patients as well, too, that we put on on the study. So the overall BMI is somewhere between 33 and 39 um, for, for the patients. Um, waist length in centimeters is, is, is 44 to 47. And then the severity as far as the patients measured their severity as far as psoriasis, that's being mild, um, but the control group is a little bit higher. They actually were thinking that more moderate, um, but they went based on my scoring, which is investigator global. And that, that was mild for them to qualify in the first place. But you can still even see with, with that being mild, uh, it was still an impactful uh, score at the, as far as how much their psoriasis was affecting them. So our primary outcome that we're looking at here was with, with a small study like this is we're looking actually at it, at uh, how to power the next study, how, how to run the next study. And so there's a couple key things that we need to, to make sure is, is, so what's going to be our adherence? Are the patients actually going to do this? What's going to be the dropout rate? Uh, and so we learned a lot from doing this. And, and so we did demonstrate feasibility, which is what our whole goal was with a small study like this. Um, overall, as far as adherence, we had strong adherence in our group. Challenge, though, is that the uh, control patients um, were disappointed, we heard this over and over, to, to be randomly selected into a control group. And so they were kind of asking, well, can I do this anyway? Um, can I get, and so we didn't give them the information, um, the handout information that we wanted our, our, our experimental patients to do. Um, but that doesn't mean they weren't doing it and, and, and going through it. So we did learn a little bit from that, you know, a crossover design where our, our patients could switch over if, if they were in the control group for the first three months. We actually adapted the protocol six months into it to, to make it a crossover because without that, actually, we were having a much higher dropout rate than, than what we were anticipating. And uh, that dropout rate would, would make a, a larger study very difficult to do. So once we change things over to the crossover, it slowed things down a little bit. And so we still have patients that are that are not complete yet, um, but it should be complete. They should be complete within the next two months at this point. Um, but we'll have higher quality data and, and, and in particular, we'll have the control data that we need. This is um, our blue group. This is our, our patients that, that went through the intermittent fasting protocol. And so the average patient did lose several kilograms in this. Um, the average patient did lose, decrease their psoriasis severity a little bit, modestly. And then the patient global assessment, so like how much did you improve? The average patient did improve with this as well, too. Now, the control group also showed some, some uh, features of improvement in some of these as well, too. And um, that's an important thing for as we expand out the study. These are the actual numbers um, for, for how much. But again, um, uh, the patients uh, on average lost several kilograms uh, in, in a, our three-month study in the first place. So, um, and that corresponds with a, a one-point decrease in, in how they uh, assess their psoriasis severity on a five-point scale. So uh, the patients felt like they were improving with it as well, too, although there could be some placebo effect here, too. So our overall conclusions here, and, and, and again, thank you so much to the National Psoriasis Foundation for supporting this preliminary study in the first place. This allows us to have feasibility, but we did demonstrate feasibility. So we, so the rate of, of loss of follow-up, especially in our control group that we had, we were able to correct our protocol six months into that with the crossover component. And, and that's how we'd recommend a larger study to be done so we can keep that control group in, involved in the study and not lose interest. And so we need to have those incentives for those patients. The adherence, though, was great among our patients. And so that was a really, um, um, we were very pleased about that. Um, only modest improvements in psoriasis scores are seen compared to the data that's um, out there in, in the literature. With that being said, though, um, the patients have mild psoriasis in the first place. So this wasn't patients that had the most severe forms of psoriasis. And so uh, the effect size could still be much larger for patients that have more severe disease. <clears throat>
And then this is just kind of a summary of, of the existing literature, which which we've kind of talked about for the most part, um, these kind of diets here at the bottom. Um, energy levels, which is like carbohydrates, how, how many calories are you consuming, really needs to be uh, individualized to the patient in the first place. It's hard to make a, a broad um, um, recommendation to everybody. It needs to be individualized to these different, different um, comorbidities. Okay. Um, and again, that's all I have. Thank you so much. I'll, I'll take some questions here in just a second. Um, but I got a, had a fantastic team. I'm so grateful for for all of my members and my team, <clears throat> especially Dr. Gray, who kind of led the, the intermittent fasting study. Um, but each one of these have, have helped me. And uh, major thank you to our, our funders, especially the National Psoriasis Foundation, which, which made this happen. Okay, so I'll try to go in order. I've got about 10, 10 questions here. So um, one question is, um, various deficiencies related to vitamins and other nutrients, are they identified easily be, by standard blood testing or is more specific testing needed? It, it, this is a really good question. So they there is a blood test for these different micronutrient diseases that can be done very easily. The challenge with them is they don't necessarily test your full body stores. So they can test, so testing your plasma, your, um, your blood for... Uh, for example, like your B vitamin level is super easy to do. The challenge is it's very dependent on what you just ate in the last 24 hours. And it's not necessarily so like uh, a patient that's been starved for, for six months and then just ate a, a Big Mac is, is going to have high levels. And so it's not necessarily, there's not necessarily great tests for that. So there does have to be some discussion and some you can't rely just on, on the lab test. I have not, another comment. Um, agree with what is being presented. All flare-ups, mineral and vitamin counts show up at the lowest end recommended um, or higher end of the deficient. And doctors always explain that these levels are not something reflective of my deficiency disease. <clears throat> I try to convince them my flare-up started when I started seeing my legs swelling, particularly of the shoulders, um, is now due to lower red blood cell count and anemia. Uh, and as a consequence of low B12. Yeah, I mean, I think these things uh, definitely can be, be associated and especially from overall health. I mean, um, even if we're, some of these things, like I, I think there needs to be so much more research in, into this area, um, but you can't argue that uh, some of this B12 deficient and anemic, um, it's, not, it's, not, it's not good for their overall health to, to supplement it. And there are certainly patients that are anemic and, and are itchy specifically from that. Um, thank you, uh, Dana, for the, the link to the uh, Sound Bites episode. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, so question about, about the keto diet. And so keto diet is another popular one. It's not one that we specifically studied, but we did do, uh, or actually we, I showed you, I think, uh, in, in this um, on the keto diet. So again, keto diet is reducing your carbohydrate intake very uh, extensively to minimize your, your blood sugars. And what you're trying to do is keep yourself full. Um, and so you, you don't have to like starve yourself, but you're eating proteins, you're eating, uh, lipids, fats, um, um, non-carbohydrates in particular. And so, uh, yes, there is that one study, um, which showed that there is a significant decrease in the PASI, um, which is the psoriasis severity in a four week period from doing a keto diet, uh, in addition to a significant weight loss that, that has been reported with them. So Absolutely. So a uh, question, so why would, so yeah, what's the basic premise? Why would intermittent fasting improve psoriatic arthritis and psoriasis in the first place? So a couple different things, but uh, part of this is, is calorie restriction in the first place. Um, and so the, the calorie restriction aspect is, is um, we're decreasing. So, so this is a method that is uh, relatively popular right now but it decreases your calories and, and you don't have to make this decision every day, but it's also rigid enough during the 16 hour period that it's easier. So many patients find it easier to restrict their calories that way, rather than going from a 2000 calorie diet every day to 1800. So their, their overall weekly calorie levels are decreased. Um, the second thought of that is that um, the drivers of, of kind of this Western diet in, in general here, where high levels of carbohydrates, especially the high glycemic index foods, processed sugars are associated with systemic inflammation. And so reducing the overall calories that, that people are uh, consuming seem like they've made a difference. 
And and then so the kind of the premise that we also use from this is also citing these previous studies that have been done during Ramadan, not controlled, but um, patients that were losing weight during Ramadan also having a significant improvement in the psoriasis as well too. For me, the natural progression was psoriatic arthritis, hence lower metabolism causing insulin resistance. This pushed me to pre-diabetic. The intermittent fasting helped me move to non-diabetic for the last one year. Uh, weight down five pounds. That's awesome. So I'm, I'm happy that people are actually already doing the intermittent fasting. I, I, I am an intermittent faster as well, too. I do think it's it's relatively easy to do. Um, and I, I think that's easier for me than, than to say I'm going to consume a specific number of calories every day and keep it at that. Can you recommend any scientific approaches, references to treat, uh, treatment protocols for nutritional interventions? Uh, for pharmacological interventions, there's clear instructions. Take dose X, yeah, five times per interval. For nutrition, do we investigate with the same rigor? Yeah, absolutely. And which quantity or which interval of good nutrients supplements one needs to take to eat for a positive effect? Yeah, which list um, with the recommendations per nutrient do you recommend? Yeah, absolutely. So this is this is a, a key thing. The, the answer is the answer very clearly is no. None of these nutritional studies are done with the same rigor, the same funding or same investment that pharmaceutical uh, studies are, are put through. And part of that challenge, you know, probably very honestly, is, is that like there's no uh, so like if I if I, I develop this perfect diet for psoriasis and, and psoriasis clears up, you know, it, it, it's not that. Uh, everyone can do it um you know just buy different you know buy whatever the the diet I'm, I'm describing is and so there's so many variations and there's so many potential variations that can be available and you put all that together and, and I, I think it's hard um uh, hard to get the the investments that would allow the same kind of rigor that's done in pharmaceutical studies and so i don't anticipate that it ever really was going to be done to the same degree unfortunately which is unfortunate because again, this is something that that's free or, or, you know, it's something you're already paying for in your food. Uh, and it's not something you have to, to actually do. So can you recommend any scientific approaches or references? Um, yes, I, I can. Uh, I, I will direct message you a couple of, of these references if, if that's okay. Uh, I, I put them in the PowerPoint and what I'll do is I'll or how about I'll, I'll send them out to everybody the, the references, if you want to look at, at them and their systematic reviews paper specifically in what was the study at that time was treated. The tricky part about it is you'll see there's four different studies for, for um, intermittent fasting, but they are different. So they were conducted slightly differently. And I will just say, or, or for the Mediterranean diet um, or for low calorie diet or calorie restrict, restriction diets, they are done differently between them and uh, in the overall rigor. So that kind of control aspect randomization often isn't done so that the quality is lower. Thank you for the comments. It went 100%. So we, we have a comment here. I think because we patients all have different triggers and social and financial variations, it would be hard to say this exact thing works for everyone. 100%. I, you know, I think it's hard to, it's hard to disagree with that. Um, it, there's not at all, this does need to be individualized to the patient. Most patients do not have any sort of micronutrient deficiency probably, but we do need to consider patients that that may. So maybe the psoriasis patient that's been through bariatric surgery. Absolutely. We should be considering that. Um, and still has psoriasis. So 100%, we need to be individualizing this. We have, you know, patients that, that can't, I'd be very concerned for them to do a calorie restriction diet with their, with their current body weight, you know, can't, can't do that. So we need to individualize this. On the other hand, I also have some patients that, that are overweight and are 55 years old. And, uh, you know, I think I can make a huge difference for that patient by talking to them about stopping smoking and, and or stop, uh, uh, losing uh, five to 10 pounds, uh, not only for their psoriasis, but also for their heart. Yeah. So, so kind of along that same, same lines, I, I have a question about, um, which, which diet do you think works the best or has the best, the best results? I, I can't really make a clear comment here. The most data is for calorie restriction, but calorie restriction can be done in multiple, multiple ways. So um, the gluten-free, keep in mind the gluten-free was, was it's primarily patients that you have to test positive <clears throat> to having the anti, uh, the antibodies that, that recognize gluten in the first place. 
So I wouldn't generally recommend that one. Um, I think some form of calorie restriction is probably the most accessible and you just have to kind of feel that out with the patient and probably has the most amount of data behind it as well too. And to add to that question, what intermittent fasting is the best or easiest to manage? It's different for everybody <clears throat> as far as what that, that fasting window is. Um, I think 16 hours twice, twice a week is probably what's done most commonly. And you just have to remember that that does include sleeping. And so it's not that you're starving all day. And, and you may, the first couple of times, be very hungry. And, and, and I should also be cautious. Um, oftentimes, diabetics, especially type 1 diabetics, were not included in these studies over concerns of, of hypoglycemia. So just caution, if you do have diabetes, you do need to be very cautious and have this discussion with your primary care doctor as well. But I think 16 hours is, is very um, reasonable. Um, if you think about it, by the time that you finish dinner, depending on what time you eat dinner, if you eat dinner at five, you're done at six, then you just shut off the, the clock then and you know you can eat by the next day. I, I personally do about 24 hours twice a week is, is my goal. So I stop eating after dinner on Monday and then I don't eat till, till dinner on Tuesday and same thing on Thursday, Thursday night to Friday. But uh, it, it depends. Everyone's a little bit different. In, easiest to manage. Um, same same thing. It just depends on what your what your job is. You know what days are best for you to do this. Um, what your other commitments are. Okay. So I think uh, another comment, um, kind of the same thing. I think psoriasis patient all different track. Yeah, different triggers. It's hard to say that that exact same. Yeah, exactly. So then I have another comment about needing individualized. Um, switching sides to negative impact factors, periodontal disease, oral microbiome uh, problems. Do we study the effect sizes, effect delays, and effect durations? Again, of course, optimally for patient subgroups with sufficient rigor per month of periodontal disease. How much of psoriatic arthritis and psoriatic yeah, um, disease get worse? 100%. I mean, so we did a systematic review looking at all the papers that are out there, and it's, it's very light uh, you know, when you actually think about it. Um, the fact that I can put all those studies on, on a single slide. So think about any other comorbidity associated. Think about heart disease and, and, and periodontal disease is also associated with heart disease. If you think about that, how many slides would it take to put heart disease associated with psoriasis studies on there? On the flip side, even though periodontal disease is, is not at all inconsequential, it's not just, you know, having more exposed teeth in the first place and, and, you know, fragile teeth that, that, can break and fall fall out because of the lack of gum. But we know that this is associated with systemic inflammation. We know it's associated with heart disease itself. We know it's associated with psoriasis and many other autoimmune diseases as well too. So uh, 100%, there, there is a, a definitely a deficiency in the rigor of study that's, that's being done uh, connecting oral health and, and driving psoriasis in the first place. Okay. No other health issue and have sleep issues. Try intermittent fasting with fasting evening hours. Have observed excellent sleep myself with this, but make sure intermittent fasting does not mean starving. You'll eat all the good things you eat. Just that in a limited duration, stop munching throughout the day. 100%. You, you said it better than, than I did. That's exactly it. So you can still get to enjoy the things that you enjoy, um, but there are going to be, you know, the times that you're not actually enjoying it and you're just kind of going throughout the day and snacking when you're not really hungry you're not really enjoying it necessarily. That's what you're really trying to cut out with intermittent fasting, especially. So that, that's that's a perfect way to put it. Thank you, Dr. Kaffenberger. Um, this has been a very, very informative and thought-provoking presentation. Uh, I do appreciate all your hard work on that.